Okay. Uh, I'm going to begin with an announcement before I begin, which is to say, uh, to tell you the couple of post-trius things that are going to happen uh, in the next couple of weeks. First of all, next Wednesday in the Blackwell Room at 7 o'clock, the very famous, pretty great Israeli novelist, Amos Sadis, is going to be here to read from his new novel, Judas, a book about traitors. Uh, and just do a Q&A. Um, so that's next Wednesday. And that's just, that just fell into our laps through the Abbey Center this year, so it's totally wonderful. And uh, on April 23rd, uh, a fiction writer and a poet, Hannah Andrews and Jeanette Aliou, are, are going to be here on campus to do honors exams. They're going to give a reading right here in this spot. So stay tuned for more information more information about that. Okay, uh, this is our last Trius reading of the year. It's been another really rather fantastic, fantastic year. Um, made possible by John DeGuyer, our Trius early in residence this year. Um, John, what to say? But, Specialize in cool introductions, but I think John has outdone everybody who's been here for the last few years with just, you know, it's just like the price of admission. It's just the introduction is totally great. And he's done, done great things. He's had more tutorial students than anybody has ever had ever in the TRIUS program. Somehow he's managed it all from afar with all the great people in, in that workshop. So you all applauded. You don't have to do it now, but we're just, you know. Okay, uh, Trius, of course, is uh, we thank uh, religiously every time we give a reading. We thank Peter Trius, who was a student here and went on to the University of Iowa Writers Workshop uh, and we had a book of poems out and then went into real estate and art collecting in Los Angeles. And the result of that, after his somewhat untimely demise, is that he made a request to create this visiting writing program which we are nevertheless entirely grateful for, as it turns out, at every second. So, thank you, Sue Trius. And thank you, Sue Gage, who makes everything run smoothly here. Yeah. And Brian Pocket, who sells books and makes sure we have not Populated by deer. 
my mom, who was raising me alone, made a deal with a local college student who would watch me full time while my mom was at work in exchange for free room and board in our house. I didn't see my mom a lot back then. She came home from work after I was already in bed and she left for work long before I got out for school. So that babysitter had a lot of influence over me. And sometimes it was bad. <laughs> For some reason, for example, my babysitter started telling me that aliens were invading our house at night <laughs> and abducting my mom. <laughs> I'd wake up to a house devoid of my mom, and my babysitter would call me to the living room. John, come quick, she'd yell. They came again. <laughs> She'd point out the deer tracks that often surrounded our house and that sometimes came up to our porch. Look, she'd say, they came into the house and took her. It wasn't until much later, back when I was at the colleges during a parent's weekend, that my mom and I came upon some deer on campus early in the morning. And I finally told my mom that my babysitter used to tell me that she was frequently abducted by aliens. What? My mom screamed? You should have told me this. Many years after that, when I finally came out to my mom, which she basically shrugged off with a, yeah, no kidding, <laughs> it occurred to me that she had been a lot more angry that I had withheld from her the alien story than the, re <laughs> the revelation that I was gay. Maybe that is another story. So anyway, back when I was in graduate school in Iowa for writing and feeling a little blocked, I took a class at our local community college called Connecting to Your Angelic Guidance. Its goal was to train students to be able to recognize and interpret the messages that our guardian angels try to send us every day. Our teacher was a local psychic named Rachel Gordon. And I think from the very first day of class, she was suspicious of me. <laughs> I was the only male in the class, for one thing, the only student under the age of 50, and also the only student who often took copious notes during the five-week college. <laughs> but Rachel was a professional. So she never approached me about her suspicions that I might be in class for reasons other than to connect to my angelic guidance. <laughs> During class, part of Rachel's strategy for helping us connect to that guidance was to lead us all through meditations, during which everyone in class would focus on one particular person, concentrating on any images that flashed into our brains at the moment when Rachel would signal to that student to loudly utter, what do I need in my life, angel? Tell me what I need. Afterward, Rachel would debrief us and ask us what we saw when our peer asked that question. I saw a red sports car, someone would say. I saw a handsome man, another would say. I saw a big wooden door. Etc. Then Rachel, like any great writer, improvised a story that united all of those images by interpreting what they meant for that student. It seems to me, Rachel would say, that you need to open the door to your heart so that a handsome man in a sports car can drive into your life and sweep you away. <laughs> and then everyone would nod and agree that that sounded precisely right. <laughs> this went on for five weeks, until our last class meeting, when Rachel revealed to us all who exactly our guardian angels were. Mine, if you're curious, is the angel of spontaneity. And then she led us through our final meditation. When it came time for me to do my meditation, everything went as planned, until the very end when instead of, instead of inviting the students to share the images that they had received during my meditation, 
Rachel said that she had received a particularly strong message and she wanted to share it. Everyone got very excited because Rachel, of course, was the expert. Well, Rachel started, the message I got was a little strange, but let me share it and see what you think. During your meditation, John, I saw a big blue ocean, as if I was floating above it and looking down. And as the meditation progressed, I got closer and closer to the ocean until I could see a little round raft floating on the surface of the water. As I moved even closer, I noticed that there were actually people on the raft, sitting in a circle around its perimeter, each with their legs dangling in the water. And then, as I moved even closer, well, this is going to sound crazy, but I realized that the people were actually, I don't know, they looked like little aliens. <laughs> the class was fascinating and riveted. And I was close to peeing my pants. <laughs> so anyway, Rachel continued, just at that moment when you shouted out, what do I need in my life, angel? Tell me what I need. All of those little aliens turned their heads in unison, looked directly at you, John, and said, us, us. <laughs> Rachel offered everyone a farewell hug and a private word of advice as they headed off into the future. Except for me. <laughs> for me, she offered a handshake and said that she hoped I enjoyed the class. And then she gave me a look that basically said, I know who you are. I know what you've been up to. And now I've told you something that's going to fuck with you for the rest of the <laughs> The moral of this story is that while angels might not be real, psychics definitely are. <laughs> but another moral is that another moral is that we should come out as early as possible. Be that as gay men and women, as tormented wards of sadistic babysitters, <laughs> or even as writers. Because if I had been up front with Rachel that I wanted to take her class in order to mine it for material, for a probable essay, she probably would have gone, or she probably wouldn't have gone to the trouble of scaring the shit out of me with her story about aliens. <laughs> Wayne Kestenbaum is the first person I came out to as an essayist. He was here at the colleges back when I was a student. Wayne came for um, a reading and I volunteered to pick him up at the airport in Rochester. And because I was new to driving and because I had never been to Rochester before, <laughs> after finding Wayne at the airport, I somehow lost my way back to campus and delivered us to Syracuse. <laughs> so we had a long chat in the car. <laughs> and as we did, we both talked about what we were writing. Wayne's elegant, funny, and brilliantly far-ranging book, The Queen's Throat, had just come out. And now he said he was working on some short pieces, as he called them, about, about Jackie Kennedy. Pieces, at least, is what he initially called them. As Wayne continued to describe the book, he began to reveal more and more of its soul, and more and more of what we have come to admire and adore about anything that Wayne Kestenbaum produces. Collections that are deeply researched, culturally relevant, highly personal, and infectiously voiced. He's been doing this for the past 25 years, in fact, over which time, excuse me, over which time he has published 19 books of essays, poetry, <coughs> and fiction. But as Bomb magazine aptly put it, things don't fall into neat compartments for Wayne. His so-called poems drift in essays, while his scholarly work swerves into Proustian pneumatic exercises. 
wave effortlessly slides from the frivolous to the profound on the turn of the dime. He's a master of the impure and the inconsistent, making the most persuasive arguments for the natural melding of things. That's a much more sophisticated way of saying that Wayne can make anything queer, which is to say, better. Like taking a popular idea or subject and framing it in an unfamiliar way, if only to reveal that that weirdness, in fact, is at the very heart of the thing that Wayne's considering, at the very heart and also ever-present, like something that has been under our noses all along that we can smell and could even see if we ever, if we even bother to look, like an angel or an alien or a gay son whose mother knows that he's been queer or who knows that he's queer long, long before he ever manages to reveal it. That book that Wayne was describing in the car, and which later became the phenomenal Jackie Under My Skin, was sounding more and more like the kind of nonfiction I loved, but had never had a name for. Aggregates of ideas, of feelings, of even dreams, all whirling around a central metaphor but never necessarily interacting with one another. I don't know who used the word first, but I'm going to give it to Wayne, because he's older. Maybe, he said, there are essays. And with that, I knew what I was, and what I wanted to be, and what I wanted to do. I had always known it, of course, but I just hadn't said it. I wanted to make things the way Wayne makes things, things that rolled over the folds of new ideas in exhaustive and, ins and idiosyncratic ways. Wayne had come out and had now made a saying cool, and thanks to him I have never looked back. Now, have I gotten my ass kicked now and then for coming out? Yes, absolutely, because a saying is the new closet. It's taboo, it's misunderstood, and it's full of quack professionals who've all got advice about how to make your essays look more like fiction, or poetry, or even journalism. You know, so you can blend in. <laughs> but it's also got people like Wayne, who, thank goodness, never do. Please welcome. <coughs> Um, 
And I, I want to say to, uh, to John and to the rubric essay, thank you, um, and that I have dwelled very happily in the world of essay for these many years because it represented what the title of this essay declaims, No More Tasks. So I wrote this in January for a panel pretentiously or portentously entitled The Writer's Obligation in the Age of X. And I felt a bit kind of Amos Oz-like as I did this. I thought, look, I'm now, like, I'm a senior man of letters. I'm going to really... So it's very senior man of letters, which is not my usual mode. But it was very fun to impersonate um, somebody on whose frail shoulders the fate of language rested. So forgive it. Forgive my Atlas complex. No more tasks. The writer's obligation in the age of X is to pay attention. Dreamt last night of a senile woman who'd taken up piano playing. Dementia had etherealized her features. Like a seasoned, reputable coach, I stood behind her while she fumbled through Schubert. The writer's obligation in the age of X is to remember the history of song and to remember the reasons that troubled people have looked toward song to relieve pain and to organize with other sufferers in resistance. With curiosity and reverence, I pulled down from the shelf the legendary No More Masks, an anthology of poems by women the original paperback edition from 1993, edited by Florence Howe and Ellen Bass. The writer's obligation in the age of X is to revisit books to which we have seized paying sufficient attention, books we have failed adequately to love. On a transcontinental flight, I read Samuel Beckett's The Unnameable. I wanted to live in the crevice where words broke down and where matter arose to compensate for the loss. Matter was not to blame for the word's collapse. The remaining words strove to account for matter's heavy weight. Some words I found in the unnameable. Grapnels, apodosis, sparsim, congener, paraphimotically globose, circumvolutionization, ins inspissates, naja, halm, thebaid. The words, obstructions in the throat, seem specimens of rigorous, refined accounting of a system so late stage, so desolate, it could only satisfy descriptions mandated by lodging in words virtually never used. And while 39,000 miles in the air, I imagined an island where the only currency for the stricken inhabitants gumming their porridge was the obsolete word, the rare word, the word stigmatized in the dictionary as literary which means defunct, foul, worthless. I was imagining an island, call it the planet Earth, after most of it was rendered uninhabitable, where there were no words, or only the most elementary words, or only the most obscure words, only those words so specific, so paraphimotically globose, that they could function in this new eviscerated terrain. Imagine then an ecology of language where only Kang and Ataxi can make the rivers flow, where only serotines and Naja can serve as verbal cenotaphs for the missing bodies, whether made of words or of matter, that failed to arrive at this final spectral island. If we don't live on that island now, we may one day and we might not be we any longer. We might be sparse tuft or diatomaceous phlegm. Long ago, I knew a boy 
who was afraid of diatomaceous earth, a bug killer made from the fossilized remains of marine plankton. I learned from a website that either sells this product or defines it or rails against it. I knew a boy, a little boy, who was afraid that the presence of diatomaceous earth in the family's garage would destroy his lungs. He feared that diatomaceous earth would insinuate its chalky presence into the house itself. The patriarch of that house had a name almost identical to the 19th century German peasant who discovered diatomaceous earth. The name of that peasant, Peter Kasten, closely resembles my father's name. The only object missing is the suffix baum. The only object missing is the tree. Not the actual tree, but the name for the tree, which is itself the sign of a so-called race or tribe or a population for whom poisons would eventually matter. There are no tribes for whom poisons do not always matter. Poisons matter to the boy, not me, but my brother, who lived in the house adjacent to the garage containing diatomaceous earth. I imagine that my brother feared the diatomaceous earth not simply because it was possibly toxic to human lungs, but because its first discoverer bore a name similar to our father's. And so, as Michel Leris and other word unveilers have noted, we travel into our stories, our bodies, our destinies, through the words that accidentally or deliberately serve as the vessels holding the material facts, the powders, the liquids. I will say unguent here, because I seize any opportunity to say unguent. Not because I want perfume or healing or exoticism, but because I want vowel mesh. I want a superabundance of the letter M hugging its G. And I want the repeated nasally traversed U, which is an upside down M. <laughs> and thus we dive into that aforementioned crevice where words crossbreed. My brother feared death at the hands of a bug killer named after a German man whose name uncannily resembled the name of our German father. The writer's obligation in the age of X is to play with words and to keep playing with them, not to deracinate or deplete them, but to use them as vehicles for discovering history, recovering wounds, reciting damage, and awakening conscience. I used the word awakening because my eye had fallen on the phrase to wake the turnkey from the, from the unnameable. Who is the turnkey? The warden who holds captive the narrator if the narrator is a single self and not a chorus. To wake the turnkey is a phrase I instinctively rearrange to create the phrase to wank the turkey. <laughs> Why did I want to wank a turkey? Is wank a transitive verb? According to the OED, the word's origin is unknown, and it is solely an intransitive verb, which means it has no object. I cannot wank a turkey. You cannot wank a turkey. We cannot wank a turkey. They cannot wank a turkey. The turkey could wank if the turkey had hands. <laughs> I have no desire to investigate the subject any further. Before I drop it, however, let me suggest that Beckett's narrator, the solipsist who paradoxically contains multiple voices, is, like most of his narrators, intrinsically a masturbator, as well as an autophage, a voice that consumes itself. The writer's obligation in the age of X is to investigate the words we use. Investigation requires ingestion. We must play with our food. To play with the verbal materials that construct our world, we must play with ourselves. 
producing language, we wank, we eat, we regurgitate, we research, we demonstrate, we expel. With what has been expelled, we repaper our bodily walls. And this wallpaper is intricate, befouled, and potentially asemic. Non-signifying scratches without a linguistic system backing them up. Scratches we nominate as words by agreeing together that this scratch means blank, that scratch means kang, this scratch means diatomaceous, that scratch means masks. Susan Sontag, in an essay, singled out a maxim by the painter Manet, who said that in art, quote, you must constantly remain the master and do as you please. No tasks. No, no tasks. I often quote Sontag quoting Manet. Writing is a terrible task. It is also sometimes a pleasure, but it is more often task. The arduousness of the task and the succulence of the pleasure are coiled together. For Sontag, writing must have often been a task, and she was often fleeing the task, even in her own writing. It's possible to read any of her sentences as a round-trip flight between pleasure and task. The flight grows marmorial, hardened into its pose, and that state of stillness in motion is her finished sentence. Mastery, as Sontag quoting Manet constructs it, is a matter of fleeing task. We flee the task to become the master. Mastery, a dubious concept, needn't be our lodestar. We can flee task not in search of mastery, but in search of circumvolutionization. More on circumvolutionization in a minute. No more masks, no more mythologies. So goes the passionate cry uttered in Muriel Ruckheiser's poem, the poem as mask. No more tasks, I say, crossbreeding Ruckheiser's phrase with Sontag's Manet's, no tasks. Mask and task are two nouns, two behaviors I love. From Oscar Wilde come masks, from the Marquis de Sade, and from Yahweh come tasks. After Eden, masks and tasks. In Eden, we had neither. Literature is the process, respite of the fallen, of making do with mask and task diverting ourselves with tasks that mask our disenfranchisement. We are disenfranchised regardless of our station because we belong to an earth that will continue to bear our presence only if we remain adequate custodians of this material envelope, fragile, in which we dwell, an envelope consisting of just a small interval of habitable temperatures. To unmask the systems that will destroy our possibility of inhabiting the earth is the task of a language that operates through masks and the avoidance of tasks. Past the obvious tasks, we fly in search of tasks more stringent, more personal, more flawed, more seamed, more circumvolutionary. Circumvolution must be voluntary. No master can impose it. Beckett's word circumvolutionization is not in my two-volume abridged OED. Perhaps the word does not really exist. Perhaps it only exists in Beckett's mouth, or the mouth mask that we call a novel. To flee the words we have been allotted by an immoral system that wishes to drain the swamp, as the current political administration describes its wish to destroy governance, and to seek circumvolutionization, if circumvolutionization turns you on, is the very simple medicine I stand here today to offer you. Circum means around. 
volgere means to roll. In my dream last night, the senile woman playing Schubert on the piano had sat a few dream moments earlier, gossiping with fellow sufferers in a room usually given over to psychoanalysis. My crime in the dream was either that I had crashed a borrowed car or that my existence was filthy and inadmissible. In the dream, gobbets of mud were stuck to the bottom of my bloodstone boots. Homoeroticism as style, technique, aspiration lay encrypted within those muddy clods. Those soiled homo boots sat on the porch of the senile woman who'd been practicing her flawed Schubert. Dirt's movement into and out of a house has always been the topic I circle around, and I beg you to take my circumvolutionizations as seriously as possible and to eat them as you would eat an allegory, biting hard into its brittle exterior like an unfriendly candied almond mantle brought mantle bound. That was an essay. Are, are 
not just my unconscious, but they're my I. So to be autobiographical and to tell the truth about my experience, I have to give you those proper nouns. So if they, if they strike you as, if they interrupt your experience because you don't know who, who's Horace Silver, when I say Horace Silver, you say, who's Horace Silver? Obviously, if you're at home, you could Google. But it's hard to Google constantly when you're reading a book. Think of it as, um, I mean, I, th I think it's just like little drops of rain hitting a window. It's just Wayne rain hitting the window. <laughs> Horace Silver, Stéphane Audron, Jean Moreau, Klimt, Frederica Mayrocker, and it's just, you know, that's my home. You'll take it that way. Okay. It's also rather filthy, so if you don't like filthy stuff, you should just leave. <laughs> um, two, okay, so I'm going to read one called A Smelly Hymn, H-I-M, capitalized. We salute it by saying or eating port salute. Gwyneth Paltrow complimented my jacket. This isn't a dream. We crossed paths on the theater staircase. She said, I love your jacket. Sing A four times with husky monotone. Three idiosyncratic hairs in arm crook. I thought they were air squiggles. Tanta Elisa's favorite cheese was port salute. Was port salute a seaport like Port Washington? Was Port Salute a way of treasuring the other by saluting it or him? Maybe Salute was him, and we saluted him by saying Port Salute, a smelly him, we saluted by saying we're eating Port Salute. He rejects me, like a dead body rejecting air and earth. Wanted to suck his elbow, write a review of his elbow, Ionic Volute hair, thrice paranoid, reassessed in theater bathroom. Sing Strauss and then die, sing unmonumental Bellini song perfectly, and die unvisited, on the verge of fainting before opening night curtain rises, inebriate rediscovery of rubato, live mafo, amami alfredo, opposite Domingo, 1970. Dickinson said Domingo in a phrase I misremember as finer than Domingo or a Domingo never brewed. They laugh at the space between my legs. Widener Library named after a drowned son. Books intersect with drowning because Prospero drowns his book. Did D.H. Lawrence write drowned books? Ginsburg capsule, his art in a pillbox, memory crumbs in 24 hour slow dose. Restaurateur at the Center for Queer Happiness, I serve buckwheat batter existentialism, Asoruta. She cut up her book in a Reuben Sandwich Club formation. Scholarly quiet man, hadn't shaved in two days, stubble darkened face contrasting with light colored shoes, turned him into my art piece or art to cool. Stubble envy began with a big bang. Gay boys in sleazy harbor bar picked me up for gender and poetry, Marxist anarchist lessons. But after a few minutes of considering me the central attraction, they lost interest and began deriding. Strung out odalisque, hipster continuo on bed. Cruel gay wine bar in Villefranche, sir, Brooklyn. An angry male proprietor, blankness, where I'd expected a maitre d'. Committed to phrenology's afterlife, taking obscene photos of isolated sentences. He played an unlikable character with bushy beard. After the movie, I told him, you're much handsomer in person. But he was not my Sanka overdosing logician. Somebody nun-like blessed the pus and flattered it. Just bite his elbow and be done with it, even if I fail the team and am accused of being indelicate. And now, let me read, that's 
one of the notebooks. Now let me read notebook number 39. So you can think of them like poems or like little essays, whatever. And this one is called An Ample Beard I Never Pushed to Fruition. The <clears throat> lonely dog barks upstairs, one bark every 20 seconds. Sometimes the barks come in clusters of two. Bark, 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 bark. Prolific, minimalist dog. Is the first bark an inhale and the second bark an exhale? I was doubtless a demanding baby, ugly mouth, vituperative verbal ass, alternately cramped and multi-volumed. The lid clamps down on the Dutch oven. A spoon sinks its natural mate, bold, an ample beard I never push to fruition. Throat constricted. I bought a gas mask today in case I want to sand. Drapes closed with a totalitarian thwack to love Kandinsky, but never discover how to confirm the filiation. Plaints constitute themselves as plaints because they are twinned. Otios is my grandfather's gift. Words piled up to impress Brooklyn sire. I wait for regard from a by source. Albert York borrowed from Menet three peach brush strokes. Virna Lisi died today, co-star with Jack Lemon. Brother left rosettes of Kleenex strewn across his adolescent bedroom floor. Snowfall I unkindly raged against. Great aunt Blue nose like Ton Heuser squawk. A novel demands cons concentration on consecutiveness. Poetry entails fussy babysitting of minutia. Mother gazed at me through magnifying glass of grandfather, burned by solar patriarchal magnification. Watching Jack Lane with mother. Did we copy his calisthenics? On same black and white TV, JFK funeral unspooling. TV on red brick fireplace with andirons and sunset magazine lamps. Three askew torchers like lit nebulae or a hair drying orgy. Four gilt plastic statuettes commemorating our births Delivery times engraved. I have a uterine imaginaire and a wish to summarize a baby gurgling. Dream sex with a hooker bodybuilder. Are we making an LP, our faces on the disc's central label? Europe's Frank Sinatra died. Udo Jergens, death in left ear after Nazi young folk leader struck him. John Arp was his uncle. Father says mother was psychotic and unreachable after stillbirth. To stretch threshold experiences, break a word apart through pun and somnolence. Box B minor mass my mother sang in, Radcliffe Choral Society, Boston Symphony Orchestra, March 27th. 1949, Serge Kuzovitsky brought her a pizza and a mandarin orange. She wants to choose a middle name for herself. The two choices are Faith and Edna. Faith, because that might have been her middle name if her parents had bothered to give her a middle name, and Edna, because of Edna St. Vincent Millay. St. Vincent's Hospital, now defunct, where I healed from my electrocution. Almond candy in white lace, a nuptial favor brought home to me by mother, who derided cold cups at neighbor girl's wedding feast. Heard this afternoon, Victoria de Los Angeles, 1958, singing Desdemona, Fausto Cleva, conducting March 1958, six months before my birth. Also, 1970, Tibaldi Tucker, Bohem, again, Fausto Cleva, 
Last time, Tabaldi and Tucker sang a Met broadcast together. I was 12 years old, too tired to give the context that might make the detail matter. And now its undescribed context falls murdered and neglected into the pit. Tonight, Mother said she wants a foster child. But then later, after I brought a pizza, she said she didn't want a foster child. Because I had the wherewithal to bring her a pizza, she'd forego the pleasure and ease of a foster child whose purpose might have been to deliver pizzas. <laughs> One more, and then I'll take questions. <clears throat> this one is called Swaddled by Screwworthiness. <laughs> Swaddled by Screwworthiness. I should say, you can take a look at the book over there and see the way it's laid out. It's little stanzas, like little haiku, three lines, perhaps very short lines. Um, and then space, and then a line. And so, it, you, know, you could read the book consecutively like that, or you, or you could consider it a string of aphorisms, a string of uh, things. And sometimes I give um, musical performances from this material at the piano, and I make up, I, so I, you know, I sing it and make up music to go with it, and you can just kind of open the book and I can do a whole song called Swaddled with Swaddled by Screwworthiness. Just that for you. It'd be so fun next time. <laughs> but just imagine there's the piano here. Facing a cool whip medical condition, bearded seer whose stomach my stomach pressed. Liz's face raised to catch sunlight, violet eyes closed. Upper lip fetish zone of 1988 intact the glare blinded. Scolded by summer stock director Jim for cracking up on stage, Jim reappeared to defend Gay Deceiver's skit banned by junior high VP. Dad underbrush is wobbly and undescribed. Clicked Jay's obituary, Baldwin's. Stubble knew itself superior and could be resented. Terrified of showering in public, hired a prostitute. Gave $2 to a woman with AIDS to buy a Subway sandwich. She said she liked my hair. In 1985, found the word grieves, G-R-E-A-V-E-S, through discipline and then chance. Oh, qual palor. Three-year-old girl's David Bowie impersonation. Handsome man's absorption in his own private activity is a dad wall. Didn't understand high school cult thesis statement written in advance of essay itself on Cry the Beloved Country. I heard Renee Fleming say multitask in her Connecticut house. Little boy hugs me because I slept with sperm donor. Kid smells familiar spunk on me. A rose shaped like a crucifix. Brother wants his servitude to stop. I culpably sculpted it. You influenced, you influenced me a lot, says Dad, with curly hair. Memorize the playful influence and scatter. To dwell within impatience's germinating soil, to explain the groove carefully without telling the reader what a groove is, or why we should care about grooves. Not to be screwed by him, but to be encircled by his wish to screw, and by every sign that in and on his body connotes worthiness to screw, to be swaddled by screw worthiness. His brother tried to play piano, but had a disability the mother discussed in public. Right now, his balls, whose, everyone's, are vivid to me, she wrote, or I did also. He'll take a night off from screwing and offer gratis balls to assuage my bunk bed melancholy. 
automatic trash congress on towels, gender hacked dad, jaundiced royal, quiet kid watching snippets of found blow. Change purse bends with difficulty to open its plastic mouth, agony of dad's change purse. To avoid logic for an entire lifetime is a crime. Disappointed that I started a big painting by sketching a large, demented face, Mia Farrow's new bare-chested baby look. Recovering from Johnny Versace's murder, recovering from anyone's murder. Garage door falling on my head, a school day event. Is Paul Goodman forgotten? Bonus pile of Goodman juvenilia. Artist shows me sex photo. I compliment his thigh, his broken Roman nose, his girlfriend's breasts and slim waist. I say, it looks like you're gonna come in 15 seconds. His eyes in the photo are closed. Is he a hustler? He was disappointed when I told him I wasn't rich. He said, I'm an ass man. I didn't say what I was. Decline and fall of the Roman Empire as index of Onassis eschatological consciousness. I lose interest in writing when skinny ass steps away. I want to see him scratch his belly. Grandmother was saintly and orthodox, and I eat hamburger as response to grandmother's crabbiness, asking forgiveness for not wanting the smelly. Mother is the door I open to enter the world, but she is no longer the door. Translate light blue chalk of red brick. Door to door selling Christmas cards and Reader's Digest, I sold only one subscription to Tanta Alisa. Looked on ground for coins as money-making scheme. Garage, eight million Nickelodeon, idolized two-story houses. Why always ultramarine as an island of belated decisiveness amid funk and diseases of the will? Acedia, abulia, dawn shone while he lolled on the toilet seat, almost homo action when babysitter barged in. Baby cry is knife to repulsed consciousness. Crossed leg is Tyrone power, unlaughter, but groan. Stoned in Berkeley bathroom, I telephone potential trick, who describes his chest as hairy, only because I ask him if he has a hairy chest, so of course he corroborates my fantasy. Good night, Elaine Stritch. Good night, Judy Garland. Good night, one point perspective, Ducho Giotto. Mannerists, figuring out light, Georges de la Tour, and foreshortening. Good night, Tintoretto, Veronese, and the sublimating, summarizing impulse. Thank you. Slavery is awful. And then, I, and then I wrote, 
you know, in seventh grade, I wrote a short story, but it was for an assignment. And I did put a lot of myself in it and felt very, it, it was a very important experience to me. But it was more into playing the piano until college. And it was, it was freshman year in college. And it was again because of a class. I took a fiction, I had an option of taking a fiction writing class instead of the required expository writing class, which is why I never really figured out expository writing plans. <laughs> So I took the fiction writing class and the very first story I wrote, just the experience, I mean, that, the experience of being in, it was the common room in the dorm and writing in my notebook. And it was just my own world coming alive to me, my own consciousness coming alive to me. I didn't think at that moment, then I was also taking a course, first semester freshman year on modernist poetry, whose discontinuities excited me so much, though I was also afraid of them because I didn't understand them. But I really fell in love then with this, both the space of emotional darkness and recall that came from something like trance writing or very uninhibited, unhindered, unselfconscious writing, and um, a final product that was filled with um, juxtapositions, splices, strangeness, illusions, edges. I really liked that. Yes. What do you find yourself reading nowadays? Um, I mean, the obvious teacher in the answer is student papers, because I do read a lot of them, but they're dissertations. I teach in a graduate program, so they're like 300 page papers. And they go through many, 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 many drafts, and I read them all. So I really, honestly, I mean, I like constantly read something, but that's not, and I learn from them a lot. It's been my like second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth PhD is reading these things, but the, um, I'm very excited by a, a novel that's coming out that I read in galleries in, coming out in May from the publisher Semiotex, I co-wrote an afterword to it, it's, it's by the filmmaker Alain Guiraudy, who made a film called Stranger at the Lake, which is a classic um, contemporary film, and the novel's called Where the Night Begins, it's the best, I don't really, it's, I'll just, it's one of the best things I've read in a long time. I just read the Aeneid for the first time, because I've always, you are aware, you even if your life is books, of the famous books that you should have read in college and never did, or whatever, the Aeneid was one of those. I haven't read the Iliad either, so that's next. I've read parts of it. And I know the myths, you know, but I've never read the, the Iliad. So I've, that's, and, and, I, and I also read the final volume of Michel Larisse's uh, Tetralogy, I think it is, called The Rules of the Game, translated by Lydia Davis. The book is called Fibril, F-I-B-R-I-L-S. It's impossibly difficult and naughty and weird, but it's genius. And it, it's, I, it's, it's, he's probably the most important writer to me who ever lived. And this just came out in English. I say it's impossible because it's um, Larissa's principle, which is this thing I talk about in my first that in No More Tasks and Hope to Enact a bit in Camp Marmalade is that language is the medium that you tunnel into to do your research and that you, memory is contained in words. You don't have memories and then you find the words to put to them. Words are the, are the evidence, including the etymologies of words and the sounds of words. Yes? Like the, the abundance of proper nouns yes. without feeling like you're kind of alienating yep. through your Do you cut a lot? Is there a process to it? Well, it's different, different phases of my life, both in writing and, you know, I mean, so like, for example, when I, say like when I wrote a book on opera in 1993, the one that John referred to, there were a lot of proper nouns in there, but they were all in a book. They were all in a book about opera, so the assumption was that if you're reading it, you care about opera, so you're going to know that. And, and so, like, and more and more, I feel that if I've written a book about something or an essay about something or a word, that then the words that are cited in it are mine to then use as my vocabulary. So, kind of after writing that book, anything about opera, when I refer to anything in opera, I feel is a kind of 
echo of that book, and so it's part of my whole life's work. For example, I mentioned the singer Anna Maffo. My first book of poems is called Ode to Anna Maffo. She was an opera singer. She's everywhere in my work, and when I cite her, I know it's going back there. I say Onassis, a scatological consciousness, Jackie Onassis. It's not just those figures, but it almost, I mentioned Michelle Lerys. I feel like that, um, you know, I don't want to sound like I figured everything out when I was 19 and planned it all, but having written my whole life, I'm aware when I, when I use a proper noun, what system it, it's signifying and adding up to. I think it's also, a lot could say that this comes from like queer culture, a lot of the stuff, but the, I would say even the style of making allusions and references is a part of a certain camp queer culture that I inherited from my precursors like Frank O'Hara. And Frank O'Hara's poetry was um, so influential to me, not only because of its like elan and spiritedness, but because he didn't say who, who Maria Tallchief or um, Poulenc were. It, there was, you just, or more who like Joan was, Joan Mitchell. There's like a kind of assumption that you, name dropping on the one hand, but it's also intimacy. So that's the feeling, that's the feeling. So I've given myself enormous license increasingly to um, treat names as jewels in some way. There's like things that have sparks latent. Like when I'm revising, if I see the word Elaine Stritch, I'm not going to cut it. Elaine Stritch is a great, great actress who was most famous for her role in company. And to, to me, Elaine Stritch is like Zeus. You know, Goethe, or you don't read you know, Napoleon. Elaine Stritch is, you know, it's like multitudinous seas and carnity. It's that good. She's just don't cut Elaine Stritch. Yes? So, you mentioned being fascinated by trance poetry and listening to you, um, I felt like I was fascinated trance listening, you know. Um, you do this, or rather today, mm -hmm. this um, rapid, almost um, list without numbers of images that lead into another, that lead into another, that then function as a transition to a new idea of being mm -hmm. or seen. And uh, I guess my question would be more of a request to expand upon the uh, deep layered images as a, an engine to move somewhere in your essay or poem. Yeah, I think it, uh, the method of revising this um, with trans notebooks was to uh, you know Ezra Pound, who I wrote my undergraduate thesis on. Um, had a theory of the image which involved the crystallization. And I think Camp Marmalade is a reference to a certain kind of boiling down so that, again, like a lane stretch or whatever, it contains all the history and the nourishment. He also talked via Emerson and um, Fenelosa about fossil poetry. And he said that language was fossil poetry, meaning that the words themselves contain the poetry. It's not what you, it's not the icing you add on top with your metaphors, it's the words. And so I do, that's very, so that the process of revision is, um, for me, scanning the page and finding the thing, finding the, the tidbit that has an incongruity and factualness to it that stays with me and that I believe in. And if it's factual, meaning the words really, I'm not faking it. it either it's, you could say, um, it, it refers to reality, even if it's a dream reality or the reality of the word, so like a scatological. That when I see that word, and it, I keep it because I think, for whatever reason, I use the word a scatological, which means like having to do with leading to death. Um, and it's such an amazing and underused word, and it contains scatology, which has to do with theses in it. And so a sketch. So when I am revising my own thing, scatological, particularly if it's right next to Onassis, it just it hits me over the head. And and so I just and the 
The process here is not explaining, which would be a whole essay, why it excites me that eschatological is near Onassis, but letting, letting the particles do something and then trying to make the transitions both smooth and clipped enough so that you know one bit's over and you know the next, again, you're not sure what happened, but it had eschatological in it, and it had a lame stretch, and now we're on to the next. That had dong in it. Dong. The, the hope is that dong explodes. You don't know who's dong. Dong. You can't deny that dong is a good word, you know? And so the, the, that's the feeling of, the, you know, I also a little bit got it from like Allen Ginsberg in Howl and Cottage, which he has for all of his reputation for like lottery, and it just keeps on going. Phenomenally disciplined molecules of condensed language. And so that's the, um, the hope. So when one revises anything, really, is you kind of cut away the stuff that you don't like. Yes? Um, where do you find your best words? The dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I mean, that's where they do. And I have the dictionary, I find them, and I find them in my head if I let them in without scrutinizing whether they belong in it. And that's the trans writing helps with a word like eschatological, is that I don't, I don't look for it and then maybe dismiss it. It arrives to me like I see a TV hanging there. It's a kind of apparition and it's a direct sighting and that the faster I write in this process of, it's not trance, I'm still, I'm not like on some substance, but I'm writing quickly enough and in a way, for a long enough time that I don't, that like I can feel words arrive at me. I can almost, and I don't push them away. And I've learned from that how in, even if I'm writing a letter to somebody, to try not to push away the words that are coming to you, particularly the ones that seem to you stupid or off topic. That's the hardest thing. When a new phrase comes, to me, it usually seems off topic. And my policy, let it in, you let it in, you can cut it later, but the word, so I find the words in the off topic. And it's, and if you literally, if I think, if I, sometimes I will like, just look, and I'll look at the light on the top of the ceiling and I will think, I'm not gonna think, oh, I think I'm gonna write an essay about the light on the top of the ceiling in this room. Oh, but it's a good subject better research it and outline it, you know, I don't, I just, I try to think like, like what is, like almost like when you're almost asleep or when you're half awake and you kind of half fall asleep and what does the light landing there land on? And it might land on Martin Landau. Just might. Do you think he exists, right? Is it Martin, Martin, he's a TV star, right? Yeah, Mark, this is it. I proved it. I can swear to you, I would. I don't know what thing says in. I would never in a million years wish to put Martin Land down. It's like, but you know what? I found the words by looking at that light up there through Land On. And Land On led me to Land Down. And then I would, you know, and, and so words will come to you if you dream a little bit on top of the sound of what occurs to you. Yes? So, how is the musician in you affecting the writer, and how is the writer affecting the musician? Well, thank you for that question. It's very gratifying. Um, but since piano was my first love and the thing I did in high school and wanted to do, I learned from classical piano about repetition. I mean, these like older ways of entering, but repetition, um, listening not just to the tops of things, but listening to the insides of things. So not like the overall sound, but like if you're playing piano, it's, whether it's counterpoint or trying to develop a way of hearing from the seemingly undifferentiated sound of a piano, tone colors, how to make this sound like an oboe, what kind of, what kind of, you know, I had a really remarkable teacher, and I actually remember her saying, what, what's in the Brahms Rhapsody, can you make this entrance here? Or she said, how softly can you play that? And 
How much like a clarinet can you make that sound? And it involves, because the piano's never going to sound like a clarinet, but it involves a kind of concentration that was very similar to what right revising is. You kind of like, you have a sentence and you look at it and you see there's an adjective and you spread out mentally around the adjective so you can see the space of adjective being bigger than the word that's inappropriately put there. And you, and you widen the space and you say, put, put another adjective. So it's, it's a kind of, that's the, that's the main thing. But I must say that since I've started performing, which I hadn't done for all these years, but doing kind of, I call it my lounge act, and I, have, I do performances on the piano, uh, with improvised words, usually, that it, it, it's um, been a, a really happy, just, it's a happy thing. And how much more time do we have? Let me take one more question. That's always the kiss of death, right? <laughs> one more question. Mm. There is one more. <laughs> and the question can't be when's the reading over? <laughs> It'll be over. Okay, well, I guess it's over. Thank you. <laughs>